Um, and I'm jazzed for many reasons. Uh, as we were worshiping, I was jazzed about this idea. You know, there are some of you here in this room, you are like just, by your DNA, I think you're just more worshipy oriented than others. And there's no shame for anyone who doesn't, is not this like naturally expressive person, you know. Um, I'm just so blessed when I see people who willingly engage with the presence of the Lord. They lift their hands, they sing, they, they bow, they clap, they dance, they do all that stuff. Why? Because those are things we're commanded to do in Scripture, but not everyone does it. Not everyone does it. So when I see people doing that, there's got to be, even if you do it initially, or maybe right now you're doing it out of just obligation. Some, well, that's just what I do. You know what? I don't even care. I just love it. I love it. You lift your hands, it just blesses me. Um, and it encourages me to worship God. Um, I, I think people who come to church need to see people who are in love with Jesus. Amen. And, and you've got to see it. You can't just pick it up by like, oh, they said they really love Jesus. No, it really is something. I remember I faked a proposal a couple years back to Petraea. It, just randomly. We were up in Door County at a, a Sister Bay. Uh, wait, no, not Sister Bay. We were at a, yeah, we were right across from Wilson's. And sometimes the sunsets up there are just intoxicating. And, and it happens that there are a lot of people that get overwhelmed by that beauty and they think they want to, you know, get married. And so there have been times where we've seen people do that. We were there and there was people there. They were taking pictures and I had friends in. And so at that moment, I just turned and I proposed. I was like, you said yes. Ah! And people clapped. <laughs> people all came around. We're so happy for you. And I was like, I know. And this is awesome. And uh, <laughs> it's just amazing, isn't it? Why would they even be in, why would they respond like that? They're all hallmark addicts, that's what they are. No, no, people love an outward expression of love. It's not embarrassing to them. And as much as your kids go, oh, gross, mom, dad, stop showing us that you love each other. Keep doing it. Within reason. And please, within reason, you know. So... Uh, it's, it's wonderful when we see people truly loving one another, but it's even more impressive when we see people loving Jesus. And uh, people get inspired. And uh, I've, I've heard many, many times where people have left churches, left denominations for one common reason. And I just didn't feel the spice. I didn't feel the pizzazz. I don't like a marriage that doesn't have pizzazz. I don't like a religion that doesn't have pizzazz. So thank you, church, for being a spicy church. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You're spicy. <laughs> You're spicy. All of you guys are spicy. Um, <laughs> so part of what I'm saying right now in all of this is a lead up to this series that I'm going to start. I want to start a series because I believe that prophetically in the last days, and especially as it gets really close to Christ's return, there is something that God is doing in humanity. He's rebuilding and restoring the tabernacle of David. He's rebuilding and restoring the tabernacle of David. And this is a phrase that feels very churchy, so we're going to define it. The best way to define what does that mean and why is there significance, does it make any difference in my life? It makes such a big difference in every one of our lives. But in order for us to understand the depth of that, we're going to have to go back and do a little bit of work. And we'll start by defining who David is. We'll spend some time understanding some important parts about the character in scripture, David. Real person. His story is phenomenal, and many people know it. There's been movies made about his life, but today we're going to start a study in the character and the life of David as a precursor to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing in our day and age, rebuilding the tabernacle of David. He isn't rebuilding the tabernacle of Moses. He's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. And we need to know the significance of that because at the conclusion of that building process, Christ returns 
for a church, a tabernacle, a building. You're the church. We're the church. He's coming back for a spotless bride. He's right now in construction mode. And he's building his church because he wants to abide with his church forever. And that's exciting. It really gives us purpose for right now. And we need that because this is the year where we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. This is the year, and you might be in a moment right now where you need to know more than ever before, I have got to fix my eyes on Jesus. You're in a big time of transition, or maybe you're restarting. You're doing something, and you need to focus on God. Well, you need to know what God's purposes are. And knowing David and doing this character study is going to be very encouraging for you. Romans 15, 4 says, Whatever was written in earlier times was written for your instruction and my instruction. Amen to that. And the reason we're instructed, it says in verse 4 of that 15th chapter in Romans, is so that through perseverance and the encouragement of what the Bible has been written, and it's all of that, you might have hope. Anybody need hope? My hope is not in a political party. My hope isn't in my bank account. My hope isn't in a particular relationship. My hope is securely put in Jesus. And this Bible that we hold in our hands, whether it's your digital one in your phone or it's the real one, is the anchor. It is. And so we go back to Scripture and we milk it for all it's worth because we need more hope. We need more encouragement. And, and so we're going to study David. The study of the, uh, this character, David, offers us something that I would say last year, this came to me, it blew me away. I had not even heard this really before. Even if I've read it, I haven't heard it. Maybe you know what I mean when I say that. In Isaiah 22, verse 22, and again in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, there is a reference to a phrase called the key of David. That opens doors that no one else could open and shuts doors that no one else could shut. The key of David. What are keys? Keys re represent things in the natural. They open things and they close things, right? With a key, you get permission because of the key to go into specific places. If you don't have a key, you can't go in there. You don't have permission. You don't have authority. And if you need something in that space and you have the key, you can get what you need, right? Oh. Keys become very important. You ever been locked out of your cars? Remember one lady in um, Arizona, she was an older lady, and um, she came out of the grocery store, and she saw four hoodlums, four gangbangers getting into her car. They had just broke in, opened up the doors, and were getting in and about to steal her car. But this lady had a concealed carry permit. She was packing. And so... <laughs> In her 70s, some of you are like, my people, my people. Yes. <laughs> Just think about this. This is beautiful. She walks right up to that car, that car, whips out her like nine millimeter, points it at the car, and yells at the top of her geriatric lungs, get out of my car! All four doors fly open, and these guys just bolt yelling, no, 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 and they're gone. And she gets in a car and puts her key in the car, and it won't start. <laughs> Wrong car. Wrong car. She knew that because the key didn't work. <laughs> she knew that because the key didn't work. The key of David helps you. <laughs> it helps you because it keeps you from wasting your time pursuing false purposes or going down wrong paths. The purposes that God speaks through this study about David begins to refine your life so you do not waste spiritual energy. You don't have to look like a fool and yell at something to get out of your car and then find out later, oh, wrong key. No, start off with the right key. Know where it goes and do what God has called you to do with confidence. And it is beautiful what God will do. Um, in Amos chapter 9, verses 11 through 12 and Acts 15, verse 16 is where we get that phrase. Prophetically in Amos, I'm going to build my temple, the tabernacle of David. And then again in Acts chapter 15, verse 16, I'm going to build the tabernacle of David again. So I was asking the Lord, okay, Lord, as we start this off, day one, what do we need to focus on in this? I really do believe here are the things that we're going to 
God willing, look at and go after. The first is this. We're going to let day one of our study of David challenge our definition of ourselves. This is the first thing that I really do believe. It's like a, a foundation stone. Studying the life of David opens up a door. There's a key here. It's going to open up a door to redefine yourself. I can't, I, I love this. I love this so much, I can't wait to preach this. And, and I am preaching it. It's one of those moments where I'm so excited about right now. <laughs> um, because some of us in this room have very little self-worth. Um, there's a particular book that was, is just being released called Worthy, and I don't need to talk much about that right now, but in it, um, it's, a, it's a story that kind of parallels the life of one particular Christian who started a cosmetic industry in her garage with her husband. Eight years later, sells it to L'Oreal for $1.2 billion. And after she did that, she realized that she was empty. And she didn't understand why. She was so talented. She's so filled with ability. She could do all kinds of crazy stuff. But why is she struggling with all this sense of doubt? And she's so empty. And what she discovered is being competent and having a self-confident life because you are able and, and doing great. Those are all things from an external evaluation. She was struggling from her youth with a sense of self-worth completely disconnected from how she performed and all those other things, she struggled with a sense of self-worth. And God began to work in her life a redefinition of what makes her worthy. Whew. And in her own words, she said, my whole world changed because now all of a sudden I understand where my worth comes from. I believe when we look at David's life, we open up the door for God to redefine us so that we have settled some of us need to settle this once and for all, your worth. And if that's you this morning, I pray God wrecks your world with your worth. And, um, and then as we begin to move on from that foundation of self-worth, what that means, you begin to give yourself mental permission to look at three important things in David's life. Three anointings. And these are so exciting. <laughs> the first one is his prophetic anointing. He was anointed with a prophetic anointing. The second anointing that he had was a kingly anointing. Ooh. The third anointing was a priestly anointing. Now, these are some fancy church words, right? Anointing. How many times do we talk about anointings? Do we walk up to our friends? How are you doing today? I'm anointed. <laughs> what does that mean? Like a different, is it a churchy word for drunk? No. Um, I, I'm anointed. What does that mean? It means that you have a power from God. Almost like, think of it like a delegated power from God to be something and to do something. It comes from God. You can't self-anoint. And that anointing to be and to do is very specified. And when you begin to understand that you have been anointed prophetically, you have been anointed kingly, and you have been anointed as a priest, something about your self-perception changes, and you begin to give yourself permission to move in a new level of authority. You begin to understand things with a sense of um, mandated purpose. God has given you an anointing. Boy, when you begin to see that, something changes. Talk about a key opening a door that no one can shut. You're going to move with a sense of confidence that comes not from an external, but from an internal sense of self-worth and an anointing. And what will happen? God will be doing exactly what this whole series is talking about. He is building again the tabernacle of David. And I'll tell you, when that tabernacle is coming to what he defines as complete, the skies are going to break open and the king of kings is going to come right through and put his feet on that mountain. Everything is going to change in an instant. It's going to be beautiful. And so today we can kick this off and start. All right. Praise God. 
So we're going to talk about self-worth. We're going to talk about those three anointings. And by the end of this, I'm going to get saved. <laughs> amen. Somebody says amen. Uh, ushers, take that person out. Oh, wait, that was an elder. Never mind. <laughs> so, oh, man. You're going to find, I'm not going to go over this part, but you're going to find for your own study, and please consider doing this during these next few weeks. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and just spend some time in 1 Samuel 16 and all the way through 1 Kings chapter 2. So for 1 Samuel 16 all the way through 1 Kings chapter 2. Just spend some time reading through, getting to know more and more about David's life. There's a little bit of a parallel in 1 Chronicles chapter 2 through chapter 29. You can also glance at that. But for this we're going to focus on those things that I just told you about. Um, today, we're going to focus on just those things. Uh, why a character study? Um, let's start off with this before I even say some more. What is a character study? A character study is when we pick a person out of Scripture, like Moses, like Paul the Apostle, or any one of those, and we look at all of the Scripture that pertains to their life, and we begin to get aware of that, and we focus just on that. And we learn that person's background, their family, their time of life. We learn uh, the things that they did, uh, the things that they succeeded at, and the things that they failed at. We learn all the good, the bad, the ugly, all of that. We learn it all. And then as all of that is looked at, we ask, what is the application to us, Lord? And we begin to let the Holy Spirit make that impression on our life. And that character study is a great benefit for us in understanding Scripture. And with David, there's a phrase in interpreting the scripture, and it's types and shadows. So you might be new to this kind of preaching or this kind of exposition, but let me just define what I mean when I say type and a shadow. When I'm talking about David, I'm also going to be talking about you. When I'm talking about David, I'm also going to be talking about Jesus. When I'm talking about David, I will sometimes be talking about the church. How in the world can I do that and still be sane? Because of this interpretation rule of what a type and a shadow is. Because a character in a scripture is an, a person who embodies or exemplifies distinctive characteristics of another person or persons, we can glean from them whatever it is that is that common trait and learn. So God will use people in Scripture to teach about things in the Spirit. For instance, Adam in the Old Testament was very similar in some traits with Christ. Both were first in creations. Adam was the first man. Jesus was the first of a newborn creation. And so because of that, Adam is referred to as the first Adam and Christ is referred to as the second Adam. How many knew that? And so moving on, Isaac in the Old Testament. Isaac was the only begotten son of Abraham and Sarah. And so because of that, that Old Testament person, Isaac, typifies, makes an example of the New Testament person, Christ. Why? Christ is the only begotten son of God the Father. And both Isaac was exampled um, the example of laying down Isaac on the altar to be sacrificed was done prophetically to tie in what Christ was going to do. It's very interesting how God uses types and shadows. Joseph in the Bible. Joseph was a person who was rejected by his brothers and sold into slavery. And yet that man, Joseph, was later exemplified, exalted, to a position of great authority for the purpose of rescuing his brothers and sisters. And so then we look at Joseph and his story in the real world exemplifies, typifies what Jesus Christ has done for all of us. He came, took on flesh, and now he's a brother to all of us. And he laid his life down in humiliation so he could be exalted for the purpose of redemption. And so we find a common thread right there, and it's very interesting. He exemplifies Christ's experience in ministry. And on the 
negative side of things, we see people who are types and shadows of things also. Cain in the Old Testament. Everybody remember Cain? Cain was one of the first that we ever hear any kind of hint of evil. And it's Cain kills his brother. And you look at this and you think, well, what in the world does Cain represent? He represents something in Satan that is deviant, deceptive, and murderous. And so you begin to see the introduction to that murderous attitude of killing and destroying. Korah was another individual in Scripture. This is in the time of Moses, and Moses is leading. And Korah is someone who represents the rebellion of Satan from all divine authority. You could read Korah's story in number 16. It's one that most people don't know. But you could read that story, and Korah's rebellion is one that says, I hate spiritual authority. And that's the same attitude in all those that take the bait of Satan and act like Satan, because Satan hates spiritual authority. Do you see anybody that has the spirit of Korah, an attitude of Korah? Yeah, there are times I see that. So with all of these characters and studies, there is something that has them as a, an example for Christ. Now, let me make this qualifier about it because it's important as we look at David. In any natural person's life, this includes you and it includes me. If you and I are to reflect Christ, we've got to understand this liability or this limit to it. We're not perfect. There is no person who exemplifies Christ who does it perfectly. He doesn't do it. Adam, he sinned. Christ didn't sin, right? Isaac, he did some bad things. Christ hasn't done that same thing with Joseph. Joseph had some issues. And uh, on and on we could see these moving up to our lives. Even in your life, you will be imperfect, but you can still be a little Christ, a representation, a chip off the old block. You can still be a reflection of Christ. And so this gives us great comfort that even in our awareness of our own imperfection, you have a purpose, and that purpose is to reflect Christ. So let's get into David's life. We're going to divide David's life into two categories today for study purposes. The first is his rejection and his time of humiliation. So his first um, category of life, his first phase of life is rejection and humiliation. Preach it back to me. What is his first phase of life? Rejection and humiliation. His second phase of life is his exaltation. What is his second phase of life? Okay, this sounds very teachery. I'm going to get blamed for being a teacher, and that's not true. Um, One of my friends was going to be like, you're so teachery, and I'm like, shut up. Um, But here's the reality. There's this period of rejection and humiliation in David's life, and if you go through those uh, sections of scripture, 1 Samuel 16 all the way through 1 Kings chapter 2, you're, you're going to begin to see these things. What am I referring to? What is David's time of humiliation and rejection look like? Well, first off, he had many brothers, and yet he was younger, and he was made to be um, trained as a shepherd boy. In the Hebrew world, this is a pretty insignificant role in a lot of ways. It wasn't noble. In fact, you could probably compare that to other people in Hebrew history, and you would see uh, that common thread of kind of poo-pooing that role. It'd be like maybe a, I'm trying to think of a comparison today, a trash man drives those big trash things around our neighborhoods and picks up our recycling bins and our trash bins. Very important job, right? But how many of us wake up one day and go, I want to grow up and be a trash collector? And if you are, awesome. (laughs) Because <laughs> you probably get paid way better than most people get paid. And it's, and it's amazing. And you need to get paid. I would give you double what you're getting right now if, you, if I had that authority. And, uh, but, I mean, it's a, it's a very needed job. But most of us don't look at it with great, you know, respect. Well, the shepherd was kind of like that. It's like, what a needed job. But it wasn't a position of great respect. So much so... That in this young stage of life, there comes a time for that first anointing to come into David's life. The anointing that he is going to be king someday. 
This is why it leans towards the prophetic. And in this moment, Samuel, the last living judge and a great prophet of God, comes and he wants to anoint the next king that's going to replace Saul. But his father, David's father, Jesse, doesn't even think to bring in David. Why? He's a nobody, maybe. He's not the important one. There are older brothers, maybe better looking brothers, maybe more masculine. And, and okay, here's just a funny thing. I used to think of David sometimes, depending on the mood, I would think of him as this scrawny little boy with a little slingshot killing a giant, you know? In reality, he was a he-man. So even when the Bible refers to him as a young person, think of him young and incredibly buff like me. <laughs> Debbie, that was not the time to laugh. I thought you were my sister for encouragement, but you laughed. You laughed. And I just tell you, he was young and he was strapping. And he was good looking. He had nice eyes. <laughs> so weird, but the Bible says it. He had nice eyes. <laughs> Some of you are like, amen. That's a very funny one thing to think of. And, uh, and so even with all of those natural you know, qualities, he was still not up to par in that family. They were all good-looking men. And I just thinking, man, all right, they were all something. And, and his dad was just like, oh, surely this one or this one or this one or this one. Samuel gets through all of them, and he's like, you got any more? He's like, eh, there's one more. Uh, he's not as muscular as these. And they bring him in. He's like, the one. And, um, and then it goes on. There are so many times where even though he knew he was anointed to be king someday, he was rejected by Saul. Saul, who was the king, rejected him out of jealousy and competition. And not just that, but you look at the way his brothers treated him when he joined them on the battlefield, the time when he went to go kill Goliath. This is important. Because when he shows up, they're like, oh gosh, why are you here? Someone, get rid of this dweeby dude. We don't want you here. Thank you for the food. Thank you for all of that. Now go, you know? It was like the first door dash of the Bible. And uh, so it's like, yeah, go back. We don't need you anymore. Just drop the food and leave. And, um, you know, but it's, it's like he, he was rejected even by his brothers. Oh. And after a while, he becomes a fugitive. For his life. And in order to survive, he's living in caves. Talk about a horrible time. He's, he's no longer welcome in the king's court. King Saul wants to kill him. He's tried to kill him. And all of that, it's just an amazing time of humiliation. And then it changes, and it's his period of exaltation. So what does this mean? Let's pause here and go to this first thing we want to hit. And this is your sense of self-worth. I want you to imagine David in this time. He's the guy that his dad didn't think of. How much would that hurt? Your own father doesn't think you're worthy to be considered as an option for maybe the king. How many of you understand what that feels like to be rejected by your own parent? Hurts, doesn't it? Wow. I'm blessed, um, and I don't take it for granted. My mom and my dad have loved me. Um, since I was little, they just love me. Don't know if they love me now, but <laughs> no, they love me now. So I don't know personally the rejection of my father or my mother. But as a pastor, I have sat countless times across from young boys or young people who have cried their eyes out and they can't hardly talk because of how deep the wound is because their dad or their mom rejects them and don't spend time with them or has never given them a hug or has never spent any time of significance with them. And you sit there and you look at the emptiness and the hurt and I just would break. I remember one time a young man asked if I would be his dad. He has a dad. He wasn't adopted. His dad was at home. But because of that broken relationship and the emptiness of that, he was in tears. I'd taken him on a missions trip with a bunch of younger kids. And in the middle of the night, I hear weeping. I go to find this kid, and he's in a, in a ball just weeping his eyes out. And I asked him, I said, what's going on? And he says, I just, would you be my dad? And I said, why would you need me to be your dad? 
because you love me. You spend time with me. And I'm sitting there. I'll tell you, you can't hear that kind of stuff and not be touched in your heart. And I began to just break and I just would hug him. And I just said, but you know what? God loves you. He's your heavenly father. I can't be your dad. You have a dad and you have a heavenly father. And I can love you. I'll be your youth pastor. I'm going to love you as, as long as God has me in your life. I'm going to love you. And you know, I look at that and I think, boy, we live in a world where there is so many broken homes. Divorce has ravaged our nation. So if it's through divorce, if it's through other issues, if it's, if, and all of these things are so horrible they, and they're big issues. I can just tell you, it doesn't matter if you're an adopted dad, you're a surrogate dad, you're a youth pastor, a pastor, if you're a father figure, whatever it is, when you see this, it just awakens an awareness of how deep the wound is when you have been rejected by those that should love you. And I just want to tell you, that's what David was experiencing. But in spite of that, something is important for us to understand. It didn't define him. You didn't hear that, did you? It did not define him. This is so important for us to get today. Because if we can't get this, then we lose that basis for what God wants to build in our lives through the anointing. If David took on the identity, the definition of what his circumstances were, he could have easily defined himself as a no good, not worthy of my own father's love, not good enough to earn the attention, the admiration of Saul. He rejected me. I'm not even worthy of living. My brothers don't even respect my abilities. His own family didn't respect his abilities as a warrior. He killed lions and bears with his own hands. Don't you think that would reserve, or deserve a little bit of respect? I'm t dude, if any one of you has killed a lion with your hands, kudos to you. I'm just telling you right now, I, hamburgers on me. That's all I can say. Um, yeah, he should have had that respect, but he didn't. And the real thing that I love is it did not define him. So remember, some of you were in this. I, I did a series on managing your emotions in real life circumstances. And here's the thing. Think of the ABCs of managing how you feel about yourself, how you think about yourself. There's the A. This is the activating situation, the event. Something happens. Something happens. Your dad doesn't call you in from the shepherd, you know, position to be considered as a king. What do you think about that? Because if you skip over B, which is your belief about that, you will come to C and make a wrong conclusion. C stands for conclusion. A lot of times we go straight from A, whatever the event is, the activating event that we think about, some failure or a problem or a situation externally, we, that happens and we jump right to see and make a conclusion without pausing to evaluate our beliefs. In every one of these situations that we come to a conclusion about ourselves or the world around us, we have a belief system. That belief system is built on something, and you and I have the authority over ourselves to define what it is we believe about ourselves because of the situation. <laughs> this, is, this is good. This is good. If this is not the case, then something bad would happen, and our conclusion would be, I'm a loser. Well, no. You have failed. That doesn't define you. Why? Because your belief is, I'm not a failure. I make mistakes. I can fall down, but I'm a winner. And, and you just know you're going to get back up again. Well, then here's the real reality then. How do you define what it is you believe about yourself in these situations? If you base your beliefs on anything other or less than the word of God, you are in a risky zone. It's in thin ice. You might fall apart when the going gets tough. When Saul tries to kill you, you might doubt that you are a king. When you have to hide in a cave, you might doubt that you are a king because you don't believe that you're a king yet. Is it, okay, am I preaching to anybody yet? Yes. Some of you are like, yes, this is good. I'm buying the book. I have no book about this. Um, you only get that if you're here in church 
or watching it online. Hi, everybody online. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, so, so where am I at? I got so distracted just then. And uh, okay, so where do you base your beliefs on? My suggestion is this. Find the things in Scripture that God says about you that are regardless of your circumstances. So you find what God says about you. So let me just summarize some of the things that I would say about you. And, and if this ministers to you, great. If it doesn't, then it's for someone else. <laughs> so here's what I believe the Bible says about it, each and every one of us. A, you were made in God's image. You were made in God's image. Amen? Amen. So it doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your size, shape, or anything. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your background on any level. If you are breathing and you got skin and bones, you were made in God's image. Monkeys were not made in God's image. Fish were not made in God's image. A weird primordial soup was not made in God's image. You were made in God's image. And when you are made in God's image, it comes with a bunch of cool things. He says you were fearfully and wonderfully made. This means that he did your creation, knit you together in your mama's belly with a respect and an awe for what he was creating. So when he looks at you, he goes, Whoo, that's good. I did, I did a good job right there. And even if you are a twin... He breaks the mold because even identical twins are a little bit different. Why? He loves what he creates so much. He goes, oh, I just, ah, you can't duplicate that. I'm going to do, I'm going to do another one because I'm going to make another masterpiece. And think about it. From the time of Adam till now, he has created masterpiece upon masterpiece upon masterpiece. And it's a beautiful way to look at it. And because he created you with awe and respect, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, you have to think from God's perspective about how he thinks about you. When he looks at you, he sees his own image. And how does he feel about himself? God is not insecure. God is not thinking, oh, I don't know if I'm good enough. He is perfect in all his ways. He's so perfect, we can't even fathom it. So when God looks at us, he sees his image and he says, I love this. This person, I love this person. I created this person. This person is my own image. I love this. This is amazing. You can kind of taste a little bit of this concept whenever you look at a selfie or a picture with you in it. You don't look for someone else's face. You look for your own. Why do we do that? Because you love yourself. Even if you don't really admit it, you are looking for your own beautiful face in the picture. Oh, and you, this is so funny. I will look at a picture with a whole group of people and I'm like, this is a great picture. Why? Because I look good in it. But my wife will be like, I hate that picture. I'm like, but look at my pectorals. They are so good in this picture. It looks like I have some. See, look at this. And she's like, but I'm not smiling right. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Why? We all look at ourselves. And God, when he looks at you, he sees a reflection of himself and he loves it. Now, add to this the qualities that we could be lost and mired in sin. It doesn't change what he sees. When he looks at a lost and dying world, he loves it so much, he sent his only begotten son. So that proves his love. He looks at the most ugly, dirty, nasty, heathen, bad sinner, and he feels that love. Boy, if the world captures this, it rocks them. It doesn't matter if they are so lost in the natural, we go, no one could love that person. You're right, maybe no one could, but God does. And it just rocks our world. If we let this stuff sink into us, the Bible says death nor hell nor any trials or tribulations could ever separate you from this reality of God's love. This is where your self-worth is defined. So it doesn't matter if you get old and saggy. Some of you are like, mm, thank you, Jesus. Whew. And uh, it doesn't matter if you fall apart and you can't do anything to an expert level. It's okay. 
And on and on, this is where our self-worth is built. And so my challenge to you is, it doesn't matter if you're falling apart or if things aren't working, you need to know who you are. And now the reality is this for you. When you know who you are from a self-worth basis, you become a giant killer. Oh, man, I love this. I didn't even want to read this, but I am reading this. Look, we got five minutes. I haven't even got to the three anointings. We're probably going to have to save the anointings for next week because this is just too juicy. I ain't even got past self-worth yet. Maybe this is where the Lord wants us to camp out for a little bit. But think about what David did. When David joins, (laughs) when David joins his brothers on the battlefield, he hears Goliath. He hears Goliath taunting the people of God. Now think about this. He is not king yet. He has only been spoken over by a prophet. And the prophet has in private anointed him as king to be. Not many people know about this. He knows. And so because the word of the Lord came over him, he believed it. Something in him snapped. It clicked it. I don't know. He went, that's right. I'm a king. I'm going to be king. So when he's doing the menial task of a shepherd to do whatever dad wants, go take some food to your brothers, he shows up serving in a menial way. He gets there. He's not even a part of the army, but he sees an army gridlocked in fear because of a giant named Goliath who is taunting them. Hey, you pansies, you mamsy, pamsy girl boys who wet your beds and can't do nothing. You can't fight. You can't kill. I'm going to like... And I'm telling you, he's just hearing all this stuff, and he's like, ooh, what does that uncircumcised Philistine think he is doing to my people? What? Why in the world would this shepherd boy think like that? Because he wasn't thinking like a shepherd boy. He was thinking like what he believed. I am a king. I am a king to be. I've been anointed. I'm just doing shepherd stuff right now. I'm going to be a king. I'm just delivering food, but I'm going to be a king. And then when he shows up, he's like, oh, where is the king? The king is hiding. The king doesn't have his armor on. Saul is not fighting. And he's out there and just hiding. And so then he comes and he's like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill that guy. I'm going to kill that guy. That's what he believes. That's his conclusion. So he goes to Saul, and Saul's like, well, you need some armor. He tries on the armor. He goes, you don't understand. I believe that God has anointed me for, to be king. He didn't say this to Saul. I'm sure that would have been a bad opener. Um, actually, I'm going to be in your job here pretty soon. Um, <laughs> inside, he knows I'm going to be king, and he says, and it's not dependent on your armor. I don't need your help to do that. I have the help of God Almighty. God Almighty is my anointing. And even though I know I'm not king right now, the proof of this prophetic word says I will be. So I know going into this battle, I will not lose. Because my story doesn't end here. My story ends after I'm king. So he's like, do your worst, Goliath. You're not going to win. Oh, this so changes things when we have a self-worth built on the word of God, doesn't it? Oh, my gosh. The Lord just challenged me uh, yesterday. I was just praying and stewing over this stuff. During the time of rejection and humiliation, the prophetic word is going to be tested in your life and my life. It's in the times of rejection and humiliation where you're not there yet, but you have received a word. Where the word will be a testing Because And it needs to do this. This has happened in every single example of leadership or God doing something in someone's life. He will speak over you a word about your future and his purposes in your life. And immediately you have been um, inaugurated into a time of testing where that word is tested and proved in you. And it serves a divine purpose. You need to be convinced of it. That ABC You have to believe it beyond all shadow of a doubt. You've got to hold on to it. And in order for you to have that deep conviction, you need a story like David had. 
David had a story that said, oh, 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 no, I believe I'm a warrior. I'm a king. Why? I've killed lions and bears. And then he gets there and he goes, oh, no, I'm going to have another notch on my belt. I'm going to kill some giants. I mean, on and on, he is building a story to prove and test what God prophetically spoke over him. So now in your time of rejection or humiliation or service, do not get weary enduring. Why? Because your present trial has it is so worthless to compare your present trial to your future exaltation and glory. Oh, come on. I'm quoting scripture. here. Did anybody even know that? That was a verse in the New Testament. Your present trials are even worthless to be compared to your future glory. So David's probably thinking right now, oh, oh, oh this, is a, this is a bad situation. There's a Goliath there. But I don't care how hard this looks. I know what's coming next. Some of you need to think like that. So right now you're in trial. You're in testing. But you know what God has said over you. Come on, do you? Do you know what God spoke over you? Hold on to that. Why? Because this is the only time that gets to be a conviction and you own it. When you come to your time of exaltation, that anointing as king has a different function and purpose. You can't go back. It's not meant for you to go back and build again the belief system that prepares you for kingship. Oh, I am preaching this morning. I am preaching. And either of you are like, uh, what, what is what is this? I'm, this is some good stuff. <sighs> It's like filet mignon, and you're like, well, I still like fried spam. So you can have some fried spam. I'm, I'm serving up some filet right here. And I just believe this is going to be life-altering for some of you. It really is. And, um, oh, man, let's, let's, we don't have much time, do we? Let's stand. I'm going to have the worship team come back on, on mass because what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to get our praise on here in a couple minutes. We're going to get our praise on in a couple minutes. Prophetically, the Lord has said something to you about your future. I can paint with one broad brushstroke over every person in this room. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, to move you forward. And everything that God has designed for you. He's written this story in his heart long before you drew your first breath. That's God's plans for you. You don't know every chapter. You don't know every line. But I'll tell you, God says, I know the plans I have for you. And they are good. They are not to harm you. So when God allows us all to try and kill you, it's not to harm you. Why would God let that happen? To build your convictions. Why would God let a Goliath come and face your army? To build your convictions. And if you're going through a dark time, why? So you can learn to fight those battles. Because someday, soon, God's going to begin to exalt you. Prosper you. Put you in the places of influence as a king so that you can rule in some form or fashion and be faithful in that ruling. But you need to have your mind made up now. Now you have a choice. You can stay in this place where you hear the words of the Lord, but you don't absorb it, and it will not benefit you. You're a Ferrari, but you got no fuel. You have all the potential to go fast, but you got no gas. You need to fill your heart up with this sense of conviction that the word of God is true over you. And I can't do this for you. You have to embrace it. And this is why the kingdom of God, the economy of God's world, advances by forceful people. That means you take it. Think of a big family with a meal. And you know if you don't grab that pork chop before someone else, they're going to steal that pork chop and there's no pork chops left. You just get taters. And that is not good. Steal the pork chop, my friend. Steal the pork chop. Take it forcefully right now. So when it comes to the word of God spoken over, you take it. Don't wait for someone else to take it and chew it up and give it to you. You take it. 
If you do, it begins to benefit you because it builds a conviction. You might need to repeat it in your heart and in your mind over and over again. Do that. Because the more you hold on to that, the more you build those muscles of endurance. And your reward is going to be great. But I also believe that in addition to that, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, all that. I believe there are some specific things here in this room. Some of you have a call to minister. And when I say minister, I don't mean in a generic term. I mean in a very specific calling. It will either be five-fold ministry, pastor, prophet, you know, teacher, evangelist, you know, uh, all these different ones. You can be those five-fold ministers or you will serve in some form or another. You'll be an elder in a church. You'll be a deacon in the church where you're functioning in some role that's really leading and managing and working with people. You're going to be doing that. You might be a, an evangelist or an, a missionary type of person and you're going to go out of your comfort zone to a foreign context. Even if it's in America, you're just going to go to a different people group and you're going to evangelize. You're going to win the lost. You're going to be like an apostle and break some ground and set some new things up. You have a calling. You can desire that calling or you can ignore that calling. You can lay hold of that calling or you can neglect that calling. You following me? And no one can call you but the Lord. So I can't call you. God calls you. I can affirm it. Ministers around you might affirm it, and it's important to have that affirmation. With David, Samuel spoke it. Saul saw the anointing. He didn't recognize it as kingly anointing. On and on, people could begin to see it. They sang songs about him. I'll tell you, people will notice the anointing on you. Some of you in this room are called to a ministry role. There are others of you that are called in different ways. You're not called to five-fold ministry or something like that, but you have a unique gift set that God is intended to use for His kingdom. And you have the choice to either yield that use to His kingdom or use it for your own purposes. What are you going to do with that? It might look as simple as committing to serve the Lord right now, worshiping Him, Loving people who are unlovable, maybe? Serving in a very real context, just in the church, you know, volunteering or doing something, helping out in some other way. There are so many ways that, you know, God gives us to plug in and do different things, but you might need to do any one of those things. All of these things I'm talking about will be gridlocked and stopped if you don't have a self-worth change. If God doesn't change the way you define yourself because of your circumstances. Let's so close your eyes for a second and I want to ask you, how have you been defining yourself lately? How have you been defining yourself lately? Some in this room have been defining themselves with this label, I'm not enough. If you're in this room right now and that's your label, I want you to know God sees you. I hear it. I know this is someone that's struggling with this. You feel this is the label. Spiritually, it's probably tattooed right on your forehead. You see it when you think about yourself. When anything goes wrong, you come back to this definition. I'm just not enough. I'm never going to be enough. No matter how much schooling or how much experience, I'm just never going to be enough. That's your definition. In Jesus' name, that's going to change. Amen? That's going to change. It has to change if you're going to grow past it. Praise you, Jesus. 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 Some in this room, I believe you have this definition. I'm the wrong person. It's not me. It's someone else. Yeah, I mean, it's not me. It's someone else. You look at yourself and you always just feel like, well, I, I'm not the perfect person. For, I, there's somebody else should have done this. Or I mean, I like your second string. <laughs> you're Jordan Love in the shadow of Aaron Rodgers. But I'm telling you, you've got to stop looking at yourself as second string. You've got to stop looking at yourself as the wrong person. The Holy Spirit needs to redefine you. 
You need to have a different belief. You are more than capable because of God in you. Hear the words of the Lord. If that's you, you need to understand you're not supposed to look at your flesh and define yourself according to your flesh. It's not according to that. It's because God is in you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You're more than enough because God gives you that power and that ability. So that's the first label. But then even even with you, if you feel like I'm just not the right one, Paul said it to the Corinthian church, not many of you were wise according to you know, the world's ways, but God picked you and used you to make the wisdom of the world look foolish. I'm telling you, God is not accidentally picking people today. He is calling people, and if you tell him, I'm not the right pick, that'd be like David saying, no, I'm just the youngest one. I'm not the right one. Pick Reuben. Pick someone else. Pick anybody. Don't pick me. I'm not the right one. God says, I don't make mistakes. I'm picking you. Man, some of you got to tear that that label off and throw it away and reject it right now. So if that's you in this room, you've just done that. Just know that the Holy Spirit is going to work in you. You have got to reject that mindset and believe something new. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Boy, I just, I'm sensing this still. I'm not rushing through this because I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to minister to some people. I also feel this, too, that the Holy Spirit said, there are some that doubt the anointing, that doubt the Holy Spirit's power in their life. I'm not talking about growing in confidence and experience with the Lord. I'm talking about you don't believe God is powerful enough, but you don't think about it in those terms. You just dismiss the anointing. I'm not anointed enough. I don't have the ability to do that. If it's a question of ability, you think you got to learn something or do something or, or get holy enough to whatever receive, you are putting confidence in the flesh and the Holy Spirit is saying, you've got to stop that. It's in the anointing. The anointing comes from God. That that's where the power comes from to do what you are called to be and all of that stuff. So you've got to shift the way you think. Rest in the anointing that God gives, in the power of the Holy Spirit that God gives. Some of you will not pray for people because you don't think you have the power and ability to pray for someone. Come on, someone in this church feels that way. You will not pray because you feel you don't you can't pray good. Who told you that? Who told you that? Did the devil tell you you can't pray good? Tell him he's a liar. What's the right way to pray? Who tells us how to pray? The Holy Spirit moves on our heart, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you could say hubba bubba, and someone could be raised from the dead. You could speak in babbling lips and tongues and no one would know but they'll hear it in their own language and it will sound excellent so don't give me any of those labels that are wrong if you fear that you are not able and you don't have the anointing and all that kind of stuff you need to change that label and you need to believe something new the same power that raised Christ from the dead is deposited in you the Holy Spirit you can be filled with the Holy Spirit continually over and over again over and over again and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that you live and move and have your being and all these things that you do it's not you it's God it's not in your bank account it's God Come on, some of you have been waiting to do what God's called you to do because you think you need more money to be able to do it. Come on, God brings money out of fish's mouths. He's he's developed the fish ATM just for you. Some of you are going to go fishing today, I bet. You go, I'm going fishing then. Um, I'm just telling you, you can't limit God. There's an ability. Oh, wow. All right. I'm feeling the Holy Spirit saying we're done. So I'm going to pray. Maybe one of these things stood out to you and started to speak. I'm telling you, I'm giving you the keys of David. If you get these keys, things are going to start opening for you that no one can shut. Because it's God that's opening it. Heavenly Father, every one of these situations that were mentioned and brought to the forefront, we ask that right now, by the power of your spirit, you come and minister. The, the good work that you started in this message, come and complete it, Lord God. Complete it, Lord God. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, come and relabel people in the room right now. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Every person that feels they're not enough, Lord, come and relabel them right now. Give them a new belief system that they can know they've got everything they need in You. You're more than enough for them, Lord. Praise You, Jesus. Praise You, Jesus. Praise You, Jesus. Lord, let fresh anointing and ability just overwhelm us right now. Come and remove that understanding that they've had for themselves, that they're just not, they're not enough. They can't do it, whatever it is. Lord God, come and change it. Change it, Lord Jesus. Change it, Lord Jesus. Praise you, God. Lord, I ask that you release an anointing in this room. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Oh, man. Okay, you know what? We're going to do one thing in dismissing you. I brought out of my office some anointing oil right here. I'm going to ask you to do something. If you want a tangible reflection of the anointing oil, I'm going to open up the altar, and I want you to come down, and if you need to go, you can go, but we're going to stay in this moment for a little bit longer before you even get a praise. And I want to take some time, and I'm going to ask the elders in the room. Maybe Kurt can stay, and um, uh, where's Keith or anybody else, uh, the other elders, but we can have our ministry team, you know, Kathy and uh, <laughs> and Trisha. <laughs> and, uh, my, my brain freezes sometimes. And uh, what we'll do is we'll spend some time and we want to anoint you with oil. The oil is not magical, but what it represents is phenomenal. We put faith in what it represents, not in the oil. But we want to anoint you with this anointing oil because we believe God's word is true over you. So if that belief system needs to change, your self-worth needs to change, and you want that anointing oil just minister to you. We'll put it right on your forehead and we'll be praying for you. That's it. Then you can worship. You can do whatever you need. And we're just going to believe the Holy Spirit's going to minister to you. Um, but we're going to take that time and do that. And I'm going to have the anointing out here. And we're going to form a line and then we'll just uh, do that. And a team will surround each person and we'll just anoint them with oil. So, um, all right. Well, Heavenly Father, that's what we're going to do in obedience to you. And we believe that, Lord, you're going to do something miraculous in this moment and we just trust you right now Lord Jesus Lord we say yes to you we said it at the very beginning of the service have your way if this is what you what you want to do then Lord we yield to it and say yes and change hearts and minds in this moment let this day be the very last day we walk with that label let there be a brand new remaking of our heart and our mind Lord Jesus, lay the groundwork in our lives for a greater work.